Uh, our passage today comes from the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Uh, it's a powerful and familiar passage to many, but you can follow along in your Bible, you can follow along on the screen, or you can simply listen to the Word of God. So let us hear the Word together. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort provided by love, any fellowship in the Spirit, any affection or mercy, complete my joy and be of the same mind by having the same love, being united in spirit and having one purpose. Instead of being motivated by selfish ambition or vanity, each of you should in humility be moved to treat one another as more important than yourself. Each of you should be concerned not only about your own interests, but about the interest of others as well. You should have the same attitude toward one another that Christ Jesus had. Though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a slave, by looking like other men, and by sharing in human nature. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. As a result, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The word of God for the people of God, and the people of God said, thanks be to God, amen, you may be seated. So I want to just give a little bit of clarity, because you might have missed that in all the excitement about fourth and fifth graders collecting the offering, is we have a fund here called the Ann Doherty Community Care Fund. We renamed it in the last six months or so over a saint on whose shoulders we continue to stand. Her name was Ann Doherty, and she was the basically the caregiver of this fund. It used to be called the Reach Back Fund, now it's called the Community Care Fund. And over the course of, like, since since January up till July, uh, they have been collecting and giving away money. So people just donate to it regularly, and we've given away, like, almost $10,000 for people's utilities and bills uh, and rent up to this point in the year so far. So every first Sunday of the month when we take communion, the red bag, yeah, I think it's worth celebrating, amen. But every red bag is going to go to that on the first Sunday of the month as part of communion. But what you might also see is as people take communion at the end of the service, some people just decide that they're going to leave dollars aligning the front of the stage or maybe the kneelers, and that's what that money goes to. So since you all kind of tried to give a little bit of an applause, I appreciate that. But I do want to celebrate our fourth and fifth graders over here. Let's give them some love. We are so grateful that you're in here, and if you are really good in this next 30 minutes, uh, Mr. Kyle is going to take you all for ice cream. (laughs) By that, he's going to bring ice cream at some point to fourth and fifth grade classes, just to ruin your parents' day. All right. I want to talk about who or what do we glorify as people. And and to frame that in maybe a different way, because glorify, you're like, I don't know, glory kind of gets... Uh, kept into the realm of God, but, but maybe the better way to phrase that is who or what do we celebrate? This passage that Paul wrote that we read together is incredibly challenging, but it's also often contradictory to the way that our world functions, and it's, and it's often in opposition to those things or those people that we celebrate. Because in our world, often what we see is those who exalt themselves are the ones that get exalted by the crowd. But in the kingdom of heaven and in the passage that Paul wrote here to this church in Philippi, we see a continuation of the gospel. And that continuation is that those who are humble will be exalted. Those who are meek in the person of Jesus, find their place in the kingdom of heaven. And so as part of our journey, one of the things that I think is important for us to do with regularity is to go back to some of these basics that are part of our journey. These things that maybe they feel like they're incredibly elementary, but it's always important for us to remember how these pieces of who God is calling us to be must live at the center of our life. And so this is a basic sermon. It's a standalone sermon, but I believe that through the Holy Spirit is, I think it can have a profound impact 
on our lives as we open ourselves up to the Holy Scripture. Because it's important for us to remember what feels like these kind of small yet incredibly important things that we've heard time and time again. I was thinking about that in the context of, of my son. He started football. Uh, he never played tackle football in his life. He played flag football. Uh, shocker to anybody in the room, flag football is slightly different than tackle football. He is learning that out every single week. But he wanted to play football. His mother relented. I kind of relented, yet also silently celebrated that he was going to play eighth grade football. And uh, so far, he's got one game in. And we'll just say it's a work in progress. All right? So he plays. He's eighth grade. He's on JV there. He had one play. I'm telling you, it was like this. I, I blacked out. I was so excited. Uh, and this guy kind of comes around the corner, and my son, like, matches up, like, perfectly, like, down form tackle when he goes up and he begins to wrap up and he perfectly wraps this dude up and I'm like yeah and then I look up to realize that the guy ran my son over and then marched 30 more yards down the field for a touchdown and the first thing my son said to me after the game when I saw him he says hey dad did you see when that guy dump trucked me and I was like yes <laughs> I did see that. But I think about my son's experience on the football field. I think about any sport or anything that we train with or anything we practice. It can be a, a musical instrument. It can be uh, some sort of other thing that you do. Maybe you're a mechanic or a plumber or an electrician. And there's something about remembering those kind of basic first steps to help you be more effective at who you are today. So for a football player, is you should probably learn how to tackle, how to block, how to throw, and how to catch. And so every year, is it's good for us to just remember those simple yet incredibly important things that help us start on the right foot. And so that's what I think this sermon is. Because when we talk about humility, you're like, of course, yeah. Christianity, we should be humble. Jesus was humble. I'll be humble. But more often than not, as we may say that out loud, but it isn't reflected in our lives. But what we have to remember is that a life given over to the Lordship of Jesus Christ must be a life that reflects the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And that life is a life of humility. And the challenge of humility is that so much of our world and so much of our individual identities are actually drawn in the opposite direction. Now, none of you would say like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a pride person, a big fan of pride. I like to be a prideful guy uh, or a prideful gal. But the truth is, is maybe you don't proclaim that as part of your identity, as many of us have this root of pride that is deep within us. Is that if you think about kind of these fundamental broken pieces of us, so many of them come from pride. This is a sin that is kind of over each and every sin. Augustine says it this way, St. Augustine, he says, pride is the beginning of sin. And what is pride? But the craving for undue exaltation. And this is undue exaltation when the soul abandons him being God to whom it ought to cleave as its end and becomes a kind of end to itself. I can pick almost every sin that a human might deal with, and I can see its root in pride. So think of, think of the sin of, uh, I don't want to name any to be specific, uh, think of the sin of adultery. <laughs> I don't want to pick one to be specific, but let's talk about the most uh, profound and pronounced one in all of our society. But we think about that, and most often what happens in that is pride makes its way, way into our lives to where we exalt how we feel, how we respond over how God has called us to be and respond. That's as G-rated as I'm going to be. I forgot there were fourth and fifth graders in here. Think about the sin of greed, right? The sin of greed is saying to God that I know you've given me this, but I know what to do better with this than you do. 
Or even further down this line of pride is, is more often than not, we think we actually have a better idea of how the world should function than God does. So the root of most sins in our lives, the elevation of our pleasure, safety, our worship, and our stuff is pride. But what also can happen is it could be incredibly destructive because pride can actually be masked in our own hearts as fake humility or, as we see in the world, it's something that can be deeply accepted in the world. But what I want you to hear today, friends, is that pride is antithetical. It is completely in opposition to the gospel of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of heaven. It stands in direct conflict with the way of Jesus. And Paul helps us see this in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And so I just want to take a few moments and just unpack this text, okay? What Paul is doing, he's writing to a church. We've just been in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12 for the last four weeks. So much of what we're reading is in the letters, if you're reading along with us in our New Testament plan, is Paul's just writing to meet the need or to correct the behavior of a local community. In this moment, he's writing to a church, and he's just addressing their general attitude towards one another, and he elevates this way of humility. And you'll see if you read Paul's letters, this is not the first or only time he's going to mention. This is a consistent theme, is that we should clothe ourselves, as Peter says, with humility towards one another. But Paul starts in chapter 2, verse 5, by telling us where this way of being originates. Chapter 2, verse 5, he says that you should have the same attitude toward one another that Christ Jesus had. You should have the same attitude toward one another that Christ Jesus had. So let me put this a little more in a a way that's going to be something that carries over for the next five weeks as we enter into this next series. Is what I believe Paul is saying is that each and every one of us should be imitators of Jesus. Each and every one of us should be imitators of Jesus. I've shared this story before, and so you'll have to forgive me if I repeat it. Just buckle up. You've got 20 more years of the same 18 stories. But, but when I was 18 years old, I worked at an appliance store here in Edmond, and I worked under the tutelage of a giant Scotsman. He was from Scotland, and he was like Shrek. Is that offensive? If it is, and yes? Who said Yes. Good job. Yeah, you're not wrong. Uh, he's right. But he was incredible and he was terrifying all wrapped into one. And, and I've told this story before as I would catch myself over the course of that summer. Like he would say something to me in the Scottish, his Scottish accent and I would reciprocate my response in his accent. Right? I begin to mirror kind of his behavior, his way of being and, and what you can see in your own life. And You can take this into a lot of the damage that we've done or has been done to us in life. Is the people we surround ourselves with, we begin to mirror, mimic, and imitate their behavior. The things they say, that's why it's so important for us to help make sure we know who the friends of our kids or our grandkids are. But I want you to see that what Paul is talking about here in chapter 2, verse 5, is that we should imitate Jesus. Another way to think about this, and Scott McKnight, who's a brilliant biblical scholar, he just did a new uh, translation to the New Testament. He replaced the word disciple with apprentice, apprentice. So if the imitation thing kind of falls short, maybe think about this understanding of how we function in a world of apprenticeship. For some of you, you may be thinking about a trade, like those ones I mentioned earlier, plumbing, electricians, mechanics is in those experiences, you go to a class more than likely, you study for a certain amount of time, you achieve some level of at least knowledge, but what they understand in trades is is what's here does not always necessarily, necessarily materialize in what you do with your hands. So your next step after school is to go and learn underneath somebody who is a master, somebody who has achieved a certain level of excellence in the field. We have a friend that graduated from cosmetology school, and her first job after that, she took the boards, and as she's waiting for the boards, she's she's working the front desk at a salon, 
And part of her job there is not only she's already learned all the stuff, but she's going to help function or help this salon work. And at the same time, she's going to be learning from people who've been hot styling or cutting hair for many years. This is a very normal experience for a vast majority of us in our world is that we are trained to learn from other people. In the context of what we're talking about this morning is I believe that we are called to be apprentices of Jesus, of the way of Jesus, the life he lived. And that's ultimately what discipleship is. It's apprenticeship to Jesus. And I think that we're wired in such a way that we need somebody to help us grow in that faith. That we're wired in such a way that we don't grow in isolation. That we often need people who are maybe a little further along on the journey than, than we are to help us know what it means to follow Jesus and to imitate Jesus in the world. And that's why we encourage you with regularity to, to find a small group or a discipleship group or a family group. To gather together to read the word, to meditate on the word of God. To spend time with Jesus to find community and get involved so that you might experience accountability so that through that activity, not that you might check something off of a list of faithfulness, but through that work of gathering with people, reading the scripture, praying for one another, holding one another accountable, is that you might grow into a deeper level of apprenticeship with Christ. Because at the core of our existence is you can't grow into that which you do not know is that if we want to be like Jesus, we should probably study Jesus and spend time with Jesus and let Jesus change our lives. If you're going to hear this language of apprenticeship or uh, imitation or all of that uh, with regularity over the next five weeks, because this series, this ruthless elimination of ser uh, hustle series that we're starting next week of hurry, excuse me, the ruthless elimination of hurry, uh, it's based on a book by a guy named John Mark Comer, and, and I listened to this book, and it was a book that as I got through like page two, I was like, we need to teach this, preach this, and absorb this into our DNA as a people. Because it just talks about how do we follow Jesus? How are we, how are we imitating Jesus in the way that he knew how to live in such a slow and intentional pace with people, and yet we as a world and me as an individual, we move fast, we love distraction, we are constantly on the go. So what does it mean to be an apprentice of Jesus? Continuing on in the text, I want to talk about a life of humility. That's the title of this sermon, the life of humility. And, and ultimately the reason we even talk about it is because a life of humility is the way of Jesus. Hear this again, verse 6 through 8. Who, who Jesus, though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking on the form of a slave, by looking like other men, and by sharing in human nature. Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So think about it this way. God, the creator of heaven and earth, he formed everything that there's ever been, is also the same God that laid down his life and took on the form of us. And not only did he come and dwell among us, a collection of people who were far below him, yet he became like us. Not only did he do that, but he suffered the ultimate humiliation by enduring the cross. As Hebrew says, despising its shame. Jesus Christ Fully God became fully man, taking the form of a slave. The Lord of all creation emptied himself in the most humble and meek way. And I think we often miss how profoundly beautiful and powerful it is that Jesus lived a daily life like we did. I was in Chicago, this would have been 2016 maybe, uh, I don't remember, but I was in Chicago. It was one of these days where we flew in, and every single aspect of our travel once we landed in Chicago, longest delay on the airport tarmac, waiting to get to our final kind of spot there to, to get off the plane. And the reason we found out in hindsight is that the, the president of the United States was in town. And so Air Force One needed like a whole wing of O'Hare Airport 
And so every single thing was shaped, altered, or messed with because the president showed up. And for you and I, like, we understand that. We know that when the president or a president-elect or somebody who's running for office, when they come into a town, like, it changes everything. The police has to amp up their game. Things you can do normally, you can't do anymore. Places you normally can go without any sort of problem, roads are going to be blocked off for miles because it's that important to protect the, the chief and commander, right? Now, for you and I, is, is in a world, we understand that. And so I want you to take that same understanding of what we view as power and look at the truth that the Lord and Savior of all creation came in the most ordinary and meek way. Jesus didn't come on some flashy 747 where the whole world had to stop. He came in the most humble way. Way. And I think what happens is we hear the Christmas story with so much regularity that we often forget how profound and beautiful it is. Jesus came in total and absolute humility. And it doesn't stop just at his birth. He teaches with, regu- with, with, with all the words and all the language in his life. He teaches these things about his way of being. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, he says it this way. He says, Take my yoke on you and learn from me, because I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. All of Scripture is not simply that we might be inspired or marvel at the truth that is held in it. It's not that we might pat God on the back and tell him how great of a job he's doing. But when we engage in the Scripture, it's so that we might be changed by the Holy Spirit through the alive and active word of God. And so when we see Jesus living a life of humility, we take what Paul says and make it part of our life. Is that not only do we see what Jesus did, is now we must imitate what Jesus did. And, and that's a pretty simple truth. That the path that, path that Jesus walked is a path of humility. It's the way he lived. And as his followers, as his apprentices, it must be the way we live as well. And so the simple message here is be like Jesus. Be like Jesus. And for some of you, you're like, I'm trying. Like, I get it. It's hard. Like, I get that. But what's beautiful is that we have the Holy Spirit alive and active with us. And so in all of our shortfalls, all of our broken pieces, all of the ways that we try and we fail and we get back up, is the Holy Spirit is working to renew us every single day. Be like Jesus. We've already seen how Jesus is, but just in case you need to see how he lived in a certain way and taught us to live in a similar way, in Matthew, excuse me, Mark chapter 10, Jesus is talking to his disciples. A few of them want to come, and they want a place of privilege when Jesus enters into his kingdom. All the other disciples start clamoring about it, getting frustrated about it. Why would they ask these questions? I can't believe they would do this. So this big brawl breaks out, and I'm assuming Jesus is a little bit annoyed because we're this far into my journey, you still don't understand who I'm calling you to be. And so he stops and he says, You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentile, they lord it over them. Those in high positions use their authority over them. But it is not this way among you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. What Jesus is saying here, is the world has this way of power and domination and strength, but it's not going to be that way in the kingdom of heaven. Is the kingdom of heaven functions in such an upside down way to where the God of all creation, his perfect and beautiful and power exemplification of his power is in emptying himself totally on the cross. And he says, that's what I'm inviting you to do too. Now, In our world in particular, I think it's important to just, I want to just take a side uh, journey here for just a second. To be self-emptied, to live in humility, is about having the correct view of ourselves in relationship to God, in relationship to others, and then living or acting out of that new perspective. But I want to also just acknowledge that for some of you in this room, And many that are connected to you is you don't need a lesson on humility because you already struggle 
with seeing any value in yourself. And I just want to, I just want to be cautious. Humility is not self-hatred. It's not self-loathing. And we live in a place, in a society, in a world where it's constantly challenging us. And there's so many things that could tell you you're not good enough. You're not pretty enough. You're not talented enough. You're not smart enough. You're not going to accomplish enough. And before we know it, we can believe a lot of the lies that the world or the devil is telling us. And so I want to make sure when we talk about humility that we're able to detach that. Because you are God's creation. You are his image bearers. You are his masterpiece, his worksmanship created in Christ Jesus. So this is not about self-hate. This is about living in honest reflection of your place in front of God who loves you. Part of this journey of loving God, loving neighbor is truly recognizing that we also must love the creation that God has made in us. C.S. Lewis kind of says it this way. He says, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. This journey of humility is not the destruction or the loathing of yourself, but it is the honest reflection of your relationship with God and your relationship with others. And to every day, to imitate Jesus, to be more like his love in a life that is reflective of the self-sacrificing, gentle, loving, patient that he lived, breathed, and died in you. Jesus Christ who knew that we couldn't get to where he is, he instead came to where we are. He took the form of a slave, being found in the likeness of man. He humbled himself to the point of death, even death on the cross. And Paul says, what many have followed and many led before have said to you and I is that we should look at Jesus and follow his example. And that's what it means to be a Christian. So I just have some questions. When we talk about the story of Philippians, when we hear how Jesus lived, where have you fallen short in this way of being? How can you acknowledge that maybe you live with too much pride in your own story? How do you realize that and then move forward in repentance to saying, God, you must increase, I must decrease? And I believe the way that this takes place is by regularly drawing near to Jesus. Jesus is like the refining fire to where as we draw closer, these things that are in us that don't match his way of being just begin to burn off and fall off the closer and closer we spend our lives with Jesus. And because of the Holy Spirit, because of God's love and his kindness, where can you be made new? In the midst of every single journey, from the beginning all the way through your process of being made in his likeness, how can you live like Jesus in the world? What pride needs to be uprooted and put aside? How can you reform the aspects of your life that you spend time on to spend more time with Jesus? Because I really do believe that we can't be like Jesus. We can't be as imitators without time spent with Jesus beginning point of a life of humility is in knowing Jesus more fully every single day. And by God's presence in our life and the person of Jesus, we can grow more and more into his image bearers.